for you to do that. Okay. So let's see. Let's get started here. Mem's micro machining. Um, we're going to talk about surface, bulk, and Liga. Now, there's lots of ways to make little gadgets, right? Uh, if you get one of those CMM magazines, uh, International Micro Machining Magazine. They talk about the stuff you're going to learn in this course, but they also have other types of micro-machining methods, uh, including uh, using really small CNC tools, right? So basically making things with machine tools on a very small scale. So they can drill holes through a hair with a drill bit, okay? They can extrude wire smaller than the hole and thread it through the hole in the hair. Okay, so you see advertisements and things like that. They can make little tiny itty bitty uh, plastic parts. We used to have a little box back here with those tiny parts in there. I don't know if they're still floating around, but maybe at the break I'll go find them and, and show them. So on the, on the left there, you can see the surface micro machining. Okay, so that's kind of like the Sandia stuff. Um, right, so that's, that's your typical gear, flat gear. This is called two and a half dimensions because everything's really flat. And it's used, uh, it, they use uh, CMOS processing to make those. Okay? You guys know what CMOS is? You're nodding your heads. You don't know. That's good. You know. What's it stand for, Adrian? CMOS. It's uh, <coughs> complementary metal oxide semi. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So the, the same processes we use to make computer chips. The, those, that type of process is pretty universal. Almost every computer chip manufacturer uses that process set. The, the differences are in the details. So Intel can make extremely small transistors, but it's basically a complementary metal oxide semiconductor process. Okay. So that same process is used to make these small um, surface micromachine parts. So we call that surface micromachining um, to make those parts. And then we have something called bulk. Okay, so bulk's a little different. We can um, use bulk to etch out large amounts of material. So if you look at this closely underneath here, it's all been etched out. This is crystalline silicon that these cantilevers are sitting on. So we patterned the cantilevers and protected them from the etch, um, and then we etched out everything underneath. Okay. So we're going to be doing bulk and surface micromachining to do our um, pressure sensors. We're going to do those two types of processes. But there's another one, okay, called Liga. Now Liga is is not used a lot as much as surface and bulk micromachining. But we do have a local company um, called HT Micro that makes devices similar to this. They, they use LIGA. So LIGA stands for Lithography Galvo Opformung. It's also uh, known as Long Involved German Acronym. acronym. Okay, but it's a way of making very tall and thin structures. Tall and thin structures. That's called high aspect ratio. Another term used um, interchangeably with the term Liga is Harmst. Harmst. So that's H-A-R-M-S-T. Okay, so that, that stands for um, High Aspect Ratio Microsystems Technology. So that's the way you make tall and skinny things. So surface micromachining makes very thin and flat things low aspect ratio. So an aspect ratio is the height relative to the width. So if the height is very high, like 100 microns, and the width is 1 micron, you have an aspect ratio of 100 to 1. Okay? All right. So, um, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. So, bare bones stuff. Okay, again, this is the um, Sandia National Labs photograph of a, a gear. Now does anybody have an idea how big these gear teeth are? Get a sense of scale? About eight microns. Eight microns, right. 
So Adrian was in the design class, so you know we talked about that. So these are eight microns wide. What's something biological that's eight microns that you can think of? Blood cell, the red blood cell. Okay. No, your hair is about what? Anybody know how big? Six hundred. Six hundred what? Give me units. One hundred microns. One hundred microns. That's probably close. It ranges from 80 to 120. My hair is thinning, you know. You younger folks have thick hair, so you're probably in the 120 micron range. All right, so if you want an approximate understanding how big something is that you look under a microscope, you can take a hair and put it next to it. And then you have an idea. You have a scale, right? How many hair units is it? Okay. <laughs> right? Units are all relative. You can make up your own units. They are. All right, so this is a nice cartoon um, showing uh, surface micromachining. Okay, so we use it um, to make very thin um, um, structures. And the reason this is so popular is because we can leverage the CMOS processing. So all the work the semiconductor people did, right, to develop um, methods and processes for making computer chips right, is also used to make small MEMS devices that are thin and flat. So you can go on eBay and buy old, uh, older equipment that's used in semiconductors for a lot less money and, and, uh, and be able to make MEMS devices. MEMS aren't that small, are they? You know, the, the gate size for, uh, for an Intel or TI chip could be as small as 20 nanometers. The smallest thing in a MEMS device is usually on the order of a micron. Okay, much smaller than that, it's not worth making anything mechanical. Right? Because if you're going to make a sensor, it's got to be big enough to sense something. You can make them pretty small, you know, 100 microns across, something like that, your active area. But if you make it too small, you're not gonna, it's not going to be big enough to sense anything. Okay? So there's a limit to how small you can go with MEMS devices. So older equipment, older technology used to make um, computer chips can be reused and re, re, um, reapplied to making MEMS devices. So in our fab, we have a lot of equipment that's pretty old. You'll see an evaporator that's probably as old as I am. We'll be using that. You know, we've got um, spinners in there to spin on photoresist, which are probably 15, 20 years old on that order. Still work fine you know, for what we need. So we can, we can use older equipment. So let's just zoom in real quick on what, what these uh, pictures are on the right. Uh, you can see on the top what, what we've done, just in a nutshell, we, it's a layering process. So we put a layer down, silicon dioxide in this case. We etch a hole in it, okay, so we pattern an etch, and we'll go into more detail how to do that, but you should have some background from the intro class. So we pattern and etch a hole in the silicon dioxide, and then we put down a layer of, um, say, polycrystalline silicon. This could be, but we just call it a structural layer. And then we etch that. Right, so we t we remove everything on the outside of that with the photolithography and etch process. So you can see we have a cantilever here, right, a diving board. This is a typical device used in MEMS. It's used everywhere in MEMS for um, RF circuits, uh, for switches. It's used for sensing systems. Um, chemical sensor arrays basically use a lot of the. Um, a lot of the surface micromachining stuff, and they use a lot, a lot of cantilevers to, to do that. But this cantilever isn't functional. This can't move, right? So how do we let it move? Well, we've got to get rid of this stuff, this support layer underneath, okay? And so that structural or that sacrificial layer, it's sacrificial because we sacrifice it later on in the process. Does that make sense? So then it looks like this. Okay, so this is one of the, the simplest um, devices you can make um, uh, in, in MEMS fabrication technology. Okay, so if you look closely on the Sandia gear from the side view, you can see 
that there's actually a gap down here. So this used to have sacrificial material underneath it. And then there was another sacrificial layer here when we put the structural layer down. So here's a structural layer, here's a structural layer. Okay, and then at, this one actually makes contact. I don't know if it's in this picture. Now you can't see it. Um, but right over here, it makes contact with that gear so that you can turn the gear by moving this back and forth and up and down in this view. Okay? So, um, you get the idea. So, we, we form it by a series of layering. So, we put thin layers down in surface micromachining and etch away what we don't want in that layer. And then when we're all done, we get rid of the sacrificial material so the part can move. Does that make sense? So if we look at this, this is how you make um, a flap or, uh, or a cantilever. This is another um, version of what you saw on the previous slide. So we start at the top. We start with a substrate. And for us, what's the substrate? Anybody know? What does that mean, substrate? It's the material that the other stuff rests on. In this case, it's the silicon. Yeah, so it's what we build on, right? So it's, in our case, it's crystalline silicon. It's a wafer. So then we put our sacrificial material down. We pattern the photoresist. So this is photoresist. So whatever's um, not covered is going to get etched away. It's going to be removed. Etching means to remove something. Okay, so you've got to learn these terms. So the photoresist... It's photo, it's, it's sensitive to light, and resist, it resists etch. That's where the name comes from, photoresist. Some people refer to it as PR. I hate that term. I, most people call it just resist, okay, rather than photoresist. Um, so you can see that we've left some photoresist. So what, what do you think is going to go away after we etch? This part, right? Right here, because that's exposed. This part's protected. So everything that's exposed will etch away. And then we take, take the photoresist, this purple piece here, off. We strip it off with another type of chemical. Acetone works really well. Um, but in the fab, they usually use an ox oxygen-based uh, reactive ion etching, um, which works really well, plasma etching. Or they'll, um, they'll do a, a chemical uh, strip on it. You can, yeah. It's actually clean, very clean to do that. Because photoresist is an organic, at least the photoresist we use. There are inorganic photoresists, so plasma etching wouldn't work. But if you expose an organic to high heat and oxygen, it burns, right? So we ash it. They call it ashing. <laughs> And, and if you do it right, it, it's a very clean process, and then you just run it through a spin rinse dryer, and you remove any of the residual um, ashing from there, and, and it, it comes out real clean. So now you can see that we've left, um, left the material, the sacrificial layer behind. We can go ahead and deposit another material. This would be the structural material, and it... it deposits conformally. So a lot of chemical vapor deposition processes, which you'll learn about, um, deposit materials conformally. That means it follows the, the topology or topography of the material underneath. So one way to look at it, um, how many of you have ever seen snow? <laughs> right? We're in New Mexico. If you go look at um, snow that's fallen over the night, maybe if you get a half a foot of snow or so, and you look out in your backyard, you'll see bumps, right? And there's stuff underneath those bumps, okay? So you can kind of see what the topology or topography of your landscape is underneath. You'll see those bumps. So snow falls conformally. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. So snow falls conformally, so it, it, it layers nicely over things. And, and covers them quite well. And the same thing happens in chemical vapor deposition. Um, it's not true in evaporation. Okay, that's a line of sight type of deposition. So there's, that's a little bit different, and we'll talk about that when we get to that. 
So then we go ahead and we, we repeat the process. We pattern some photoresist. Okay. Right, so you can see here that we've patterned the photoresist. So what's going to etch away? Whatever's showing. Okay. Um, whoops, I went up too far. There's the photoresist. Okay, right here, the purple again. And then if we go back down, um, we'll etch whatever's showing. So all of this material over here is gone. Okay. Now, depending on your etch uh, chemistry, this material may not etch either. Okay. So you can see this is exposed a little bit, but it didn't etch away. So that can happen. Okay. So, you know, it, the devil's in the details of the chemistry. But now we're going to put the um, put the material in another uh, bath. Okay, so you can see we've etched away the sacrificial material and left the structural material behind. So we created a little flap. Now this structure is one of the first MEMS devices patented. If you look up patents for MEMS, the first one of the first is a little little flap. They didn't even call it MEMS back then. It was the first. Uh, um, device that combined electrical and mechanical movement on a small scale. Okay? <clears throat> so that gives you a, a basic idea um, of how it works. And if you um, are patient and you think about the process really well, you can make quite complex structures just by layering thin films and etching away what you don't want. So this is a, a really complex um, uh, drive mechanism. You can see there's several layers here. You've got a layer underneath right down here. You've got this top layer and then an intermediate layer. This is a drive gear, so it drives this gear. Okay, I don't know what it's hooked up to. And then these are connected to um, linear actuators. So this will pull on the, on the gear causing this to turn one tooth, or this actuator can pull on it and make it go one tooth, and this will jump over to the next gear. So you can have two different motors driving this one gear set. Okay, so if you take the design class, you'll be designing structures like this. So in surface micromachining, we use the sacrificial layer. Um, we've already talked about what that is. That's a, that's a layer used to make a space, okay, or to provide a pass-through. So you can connect one layer, one structural layer, to another. And we like to use the um, analogy of a keystone bridge. Okay, so keystone bridges are really cool. These go way back. The Romans were really good at building these kind of um, arcs. And there's, you can build these with no mortar, okay, if you're really good at cutting rock. So you can see each one of these um, stones are cut slightly different all the way around. And this is called the keystone because that's the last um, stone they put in place. So once you put this stone in place, the structure is freestanding and you can remove the scaffolding. So we like to use this as an example of surface micromachining because we have a sacrificial layer analogy. That's the scaffold. Okay. So you'll see some questions in the homework assignment that, that talk about that. Right. So here's your scaffolding. You, you build that first and then you put your stones on it. And once they're in place, you can remove the scaffold and these stones won't move. And these will last thousands of years. There are bridges that, are, that still have cars and trucks going across it every day in Italy that were built by the Romans 2,000 years ago. It's amazing stuff, right? You think our I-40 bridge that goes across the Rio Grande is going to last 2,000 years? Probably not, right? So that's kind of impressive. But if you were to build something like that today, it would cost you an arm and a leg, right? Because the labor is pretty intense cut stone like that. So sacrificial layer is kind of like um, 
like the scaffolding. So what kind of materials are used? Well, um, the, in, in Sandia, when they do their surface micromachining, they use silicon dioxide as the sacrificial layer. That gets dissolved out at the end of the process using something um, like hydrofluoric acid. Right? Hydrofluoric acid will dissolve out silicon dioxide. Um, polycrystalline is the structural layer. So that's deposited using chemical vapor deposition in a furnace. And they either use, they use dichlorosilane or silane right, to deposit as a source for silicon. Because as you're building up more layers, you need a new source of silicon. You can't just grow more silicon on, on top of the crystal because it's covered with other materials. So you can deposit polycrystalline silicon. And, you know, silicon dioxide also makes a good insulator for electrical insulation, and silicon nitride is also used in um, surface micromachining as an uh, insulator. In our case, we're going to use silicon, uh, I mean, silicon nitride, SIN, we're going to use silicon nitride as the membrane for our pressure sensor. So it's going to be a flexible membrane. And on the other side of the wafer, the same material will ask, and will act as a hard mask to protect from the etching. So we only etch certain parts of the polycrystalline uh, or the crystalline silicon substrate underneath. So silicon nitride is used as an insulator but also as a hard mask and also as a structural material. So you can use materials for different things. And then there's something called SAM coatings. Okay, SAM coatings are, are thin monolayers. Mono means one. Right, one atom or one molecule thick, typically. So self-assembled means that you don't have to do much. You just have to put the, put the material that you're coating in the presence of a vapor, for example, and it'll self-assemble into its own monolayer. So we do that with um, HMDS. So if you, did the, if you did the tourist wafer in the intro class, um, we put hexamethyl disilozane on the wafer. Usually we do that with a vapor. Okay, So those molecules will self-assemble on the surface and it makes the surface repel water. What's that called? Do you guys remember? Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. So we'll have some fun with that this semester if we get some extra time. We'll play with some hydrophobic uh, wafers and show you what that is. Okay. So we start with a crystalline silicon wafer. Usually uh, we deposit or grow a thin film on the wafer surface. Um, a lot of times people will, will make their first surface or their first layer silicon dioxide. So you can grow that like you would grow rust on metal. FeO2 is rust. SiO2 is silicon rust. Call it silicon dioxide, right? So we can grow silicon dioxide on the wafer, and we have some units on that we'll be covering this semester. We can use water vapor to do the same thing. Okay, so you can see that, right? If you have a source of oxygen in the water, this is H2O, and you combine it with silicon, you can get silicon dioxide, and you get some hydrogen gas left over. Okay, and we can use chemical vapor deposition to put other types of materials down to make your structural and sacrificial layers. You can coat the layers. Uh, sometimes you might need to coat structural layers so that you can pump fluids through it. Or you might want to coat the layer or the, 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 um, the structures with different types of um, materials so they can act as sensors. Okay. But the processing you use for a lot of the, this stuff is similar from step to step. It's just the material changes. Of course, we have to make patterns. And the most common way to make a pattern is to use photolithography. So we'll have a unit that goes into gory detail on that. But this is just an overview. So if we look at this, this picture, okay, this is, um, this is a view a schematic of what happens inside of a stepper. A stepper is a type of photolithography tool or pattern transfer tool. So we have a mask, okay, 
also called a reticle. So we use the term reticle and mask interchangeably. Technically, a mask um, is, is the image or pattern that, that you don't project through a lens. It's a one-to-one. -one. And a reticle actually is projected through a lens, so it's shrunk down. Okay? When I worked at TI, they used the term mask and reticle interchangeably. When I worked at Philips, they talked about masks, even though they were technically using reticles. So each company has its own set of um, terminology. So we present you with, with both here so you know what they're talking about when you're in an interview. So we got light going through the mask, and then we, can or, we may or may not send it through a lens. When we do our processing in the clean room, we don't use a lens. It's just right, right making contact right on the surface, the, the pattern. Um, but this shows you what most people do when making MEMS devices. Okay? And then we project the mask field onto a wafer. So in this case, we're using a stepper, right? And you can see that each field has been projected onto the um, wafer one by one. Okay? And it does it in, usually in a serpentine pattern. It goes back and forth like this. So the stage moves that the mat or that the uh, wafer is sitting on. So the stage goes back and forth, up and down, and at each step they open and close a shutter to put the light through the through the reticle. So you create um, a pattern over and over and over on the wafer. Okay, and then you go ahead and develop it with with developers. So the photoresist is sensitive to light. So where the light hits is where it's going to get dissolved away. That's where a positive photoresist, which is about 99% of what we use. There are chemistries that do the opposite. Okay, that's called a negative photoresist. So where the light hits, the uh, photoresist actually gets harder and remains on the wafer, and everything else is washed away. Okay, this will make more sense as well. Okay, so now we have. Um, Another uh, um, view of what it looks like from top down and then looking at it from the, the side view. So this might help you see what's going on. Okay, so if you look at the top view, right, um, we have a structure here that we've patterned onto the wafer. And if you look, on, look at the side view, if we cut across here, you can see you see the the resist profile so this is a profile view or a side view okay and we look at a lot of pictures this way in in processing um, we'll we'll look at structures in a scanning electron microscope at an angle or we'll actually break the wafer and cut it on the side and look at it from a side view so we can see what's going on and that allows you to see if you've got any garbage on the edges it allows you to see if you've cleared all the way through. Because if you don't clear all the way through, then you're not going to etch this part away. Okay? So if we look at it after etching, okay, you can see um, that where the photoresist remained, right, right here, it protected the structure underneath, and then it etched everything else away. So this is a classic surface micromachining type process. You put a layer down, you pattern it, whatever shows after patterning gets etched away. Okay? Different ways to etch things. Now we also have to do some surface conditioning on occasion, because what happens after we build up layer and layer and layer? You can see, we, since we have that conformal deposition, you can see these bumps forming, right? So it gets bumpier and bumpier. And if I, if I put another sacrificial layer on top of here, it'll be even bumpier, won't it? Okay? So that, that can be a bad thing if you're making moving parts. Okay? So if you look at this, this side view, you can really tell that it gets real bumpy.
using something called um, CMP, which is chem uh, chemical mechanical polishing. Chemical mechanical polishing. If we don't do that, we can have this sort of problem. And this is this is a lessons learned from Sandia. They were making these wonderful designs, right? So they want this structure, this linkage arm moves right back and forth and causes this to go back and forth. But the problem is, is because of the topology, you can see how this has come down and come back up instead of being flat. This, o this overhang crashes into this moving part, so it really binds it up. Like a dimple? Uh, it's an unintentional dimple, right? It's unintentional because if you try to move this back and forth, it's going to jam here, isn't it? So I see one on the right side. Yeah, this, is this, this is unintentional, right? Because if you think about it, this structure was patterned and etched. Then we put a sacrificial layer here. Let's see if I can draw it in. So then when we put our sacrificial layer in, right, it went around. Um, let's make this really fat. There we go. You know, when we put that sacrificial layer down, it does this kind of stuff because it's conformal, right? So then that way, when you put your um, structural layer in, it's going to coat this way too, isn't it? So that's what happens, and you get this jam right here. Okay, so that's not a good thing. So um, when Sandia ran into that, they did some creative design to get around it for a while, but it really put limits on what they could design. So they decided to do chemical mechanical polishing, which is something that the folks that were making DRAMs were doing. They had that same problem. They would make layer after layer after layer of electrical interconnects, and now you have all of these electrical lines going up and down and up and down, right, because of the topography. It was so bad that you'd actually create fuses, right? If you, if you have something go over a hill, go down, where it goes over that hill, it's very, very thin. All right, and if you try to pump some current through there, it will blow because you just made a fuse. If you look at fuses, that's how they work, right? You got thick wires coming in, the wires thin up to a certain point, so it can only handle so much current. And if you push too much current in there, right, the wire heats up and burns. So they were seeing the same thing with making DRAMs and, and you know, five and six metal layer um, logic. So they had to do all kinds of crazy stuff to try to get rid of that topography so that they could pattern on a flat surface. And think about it, too, if you're thinking about photonics, right? You guys also are studying photonics. If you image something on a flat surface, you can make it sharp, right? Now try to image a pattern on a bumpy surface. There's going to be parts of that image that are out of focus, right? They're either going to be wider or thinner than on your, on your mask. Right? So try to, make, try to focus something on a bumpy surface. And you have to remember, in photolithography, when you're, when you're making very, very small structures, your depth of focus is very small. It can be less than a micron. So if you have something that's bumpy, that's going two, three tenths of a micron up and down, and in some cases half a micron, you're going to have some places that are in focus and some places that are whacked, right? way out of focus. All right, so how do we get rid of that? Well, we get rid of the bumps. So you can see here, okay, we got rid of the bumps, right? We don't have this, this bump in here anymore. It's all flat. Now, how did we do that? How do you think we did that? CMP. CMP, that's what we're talking about. So what, what happens? We, when we put in our... Um, our our conformal layer, it's going to do this, right? But if we make it thicker, really thick, it's still going to have this bumpiness to it, right? But you could make it so thick, right? It's still bumpy. But if you make it really, really thick, 
you can get to the point where you can go in and polish it away. So first they grow? So they grow it really thick, exactly. Yeah, they use silicon dioxide usually, right? And then they polish it back with chemical mechanical polishing. Ugh. Give me a break here. Chemical, mecha chemical mechanical polishing. Yeah, Let's see, does my finger work? Yeah, my finger works. So, so you can get it really flat on top, right? So I use polishing and I make it really flat on top and now when I deposit my structural layer it's going to deposit flat, right? And then when I pattern it and etch it, we're going to have a really flat structure. Okay? Me um, chemical mecha mechanical polishing is all about. So, you know, so surface micromachining deals with thin layers. One of the problems you come across with thin layers is you can get topography problems, a lot of bumpiness. Um, you can get rid of that by just depositing thicker and then polishing back. So it's like, like that snow analogy, right? You see all the bumps in your backyard after the snowfall, and then you go in with a 2 by 4 and you flatten the top of the snow. Now the snow is real flat even though what's underneath is bumpy. Kind of makes sense, right? So there are pros and cons to anything that you do. The pros of doing surface micromachining is you use CMOS infrastructure. So you use all the equipment that's available from, uh, from making transistors and computer chips. And if you use the older equipment, it can be pretty cheap. Batch fabrication, right? We make things more than one at a time. So we can make hundreds or even thousands of MEMS devices on a wafer. So that's pretty cool. So that's what batch fabrication is. You do it in, in, in many, at, at many wafers at a time. Okay. Um, silicon is, is actually a very good mechanical material. There's an article by, is it Pister? I'll find the article. It's, it's called um, Silicon as a, as a Mechanical Material or something like that, and I'll post that. I actually have assignments around that that are pretty interesting. Um, you can make mechanical devices using surface micromachining that actually work with logic components. So you can build moving parts and circuits at the same time on the same chip. That's what they use for making the three-axis accelerometers that are in your cars, crash bag sensors, that sort of thing. So they have the logic as well as the, the MEMS device. And you can kind of see that in this corner here. So here are the MEMS devices, and here's all the logic around it. You have to be careful because at one step you have to release the, uh, the mechanical devices. You have to dissolve that sacrificial material away. So you don't want to dissolve your circuits too which has insulators in it as well. So there's some tricks you have to play to compensate for that. There are some cons, right? We're limited in, th in the materials we can use using a CMOS structure or CMOS infrastructure. And the devices tend to be pretty darn flat. Doesn't work for everything, right? If you're making microfluidic channels for a biomems application, you don't want it that flat. You might want to be able to pump a little bit more liquid through a channel, so it has to be kind of deep. And then you have issues with stiction. Stiction, that's a physics term. You've never heard that before, have you, Cambies? <laughs> so stiction is a combination of friction and sticking. Okay, so if you have two materials that are the same, okay, and you get them very, very close to each other, they'll actually stick. Right? There's something called van der Waals forces when two materials get real close. I teach about that in the intro class. Some of you have me in intro, so you probably heard about it. Um, but we can talk more about stiction later. It's basically the two materials get stuck with each other, and Sandia ran into this a lot, and so did TI when they were making their digital mirror devices. Um, when you do that release, when you dissolve out the silicon dioxide, you're left with a fluid in between the two moving parts, right? Kind of visualize that. 
So you're dissolving out that material under the cantilever, and it's turning into a liquid. Now if I pull the liquid out, I'm going to have a liquid air interface. Liquid air interface. So you get a meniscus. You know what a meniscus is? You ever look like you put fluid in a graduated cylinder in chemistry class? You see how it wants to climb up on the side walls? The meniscus is the part that's the interface between the air and the liquid. Okay, so what happens? You get surface tension on, on the surface of the water or the fluid, and that wants to pull things together. So now you've got this really small part that's very flexible. You're going to pull it together, and those two parts are going to come into contact with each other as you're, as you're drying out the, the liquid in between the two parts. And if the two parts are real flat in the same material, they're going to come close together and they're going to stick because they're short, um, short length um, forces called van der Waals forces that come into play. So when two things get extremely close to each other, they attract a lot, right? It's not a 1 over r squared, but they're like 1 over r to the fourth or 1 over r to the fifth. So r is the distance that the two materials are from each other. So if that r in the denominator gets really, really small and it's cubed or you know, to the fourth power or something like that, when they get extremely close to each other, that, that force is extremely strong and it's hard to break. And they call that stiction. You can actually lock parts up. So that was a big issue for a while, but they figured out how to get around that by doing um, different types of... Um, um, drying, and they call it critical point drying. So um, I'll just tell you briefly that you get rid of the water-air interface, you basically freeze the solution, and then you let it sublimate. So it goes from a solid into a gas without forming the meniscus. So you don't pull those parts together. So again, you're, you're leveraging chemistry, right, with critical point drying chemistry you learn about critical points. Okay, so here's, here's some other components you can make. This is a real famous one. It's called a comb drive. Okay, this, these were the first kind of engines made. Um, and they also are basis for sensors. So you can see that you have these, these little <coughs> combs here, right? They're, think of this as a comb and this as a comb. And then the comb is shifted slightly so the teeth inter, not interlock, but they're interdigitated, they call that, interdigitated comb drive. So now you see, okay, I've got these combs here, these teeth here, and then I've got the teeth on the other side. If I make this a, a, a positive and this a negative, right, what happens with these combs? Right, you've got combs here. And you got combs here. One's positive, one's negative. What's what's going to happen? They're going to attract, right? So um, you get a force like this, right? There's your force. You have an attraction force. So one set of combs will move into the other set of combs. So one's designed to be anchored down. It doesn't move. The other one will move. It's set, set on springs. So I turn the voltage on. They come together. I turn the voltage off. The springs take over, and they go back apart. So now you can make something that comes together and goes apart. So you have a motor. You can create motion from an electrical signal. Right? Pretty simple. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is if you, if you check the capacitance out, the capacitance will change depending on how far in one comb is relative to the other. So you can turn this into a sensor too, right? That's what's in the Wii controller. Comb, basically comb drives that are turned into sensors. Okay? So if you look closely, you can see over here, this is, a, this is actually a spring. This is a part of a spring. The spring is anchored here, but it's allowed to flex here and here. So this is anchored to the, to the part that's hooked up to this comb. So this one's allowed to move back and forth. And here's a shuttle that's, that's um, 
connected to this set of combs. So the, these combs can move back and forth and these are anchored down. So that's a comb drive, but it can also be a sensor. And that's the case with a lot of things, right? A microphone is a moving membrane and you turn it into an electrical signal, right? But a speaker is you put in an electrical signal and the membrane moves. You can turn your speaker into a microphone. It's not a very good one because it's not designed to be a microphone. But we used to do that as kids. We used to plug speakers into the mic jack on our little tape recorders. And then we'd spy on people, right? Yeah, geek kids. So what are you going to do? Okay. I don't know if you guys did that as kids. That kind of stuff. You can also make um, RF switches. Radio frequency switches. So this is a kind of an interesting thing for those of you in electronics. You can have a signal. Let's see if I can remember how this works. Yeah, you have a signal going through this way with this lead down here, right? And then you have actuator plates here and here. So if I apply a voltage onto that, uh, let's make this a little bit smaller. So if I put a voltage here and here, right, let's say plus voltage, and then notice that this part, this plate here, is grounded. You know, if this is ground, then if I put a plus voltage on this, this plate that's underneath, then your negative charges will flow up the ground and you'll get negative charges on the plate. You'll have a positive voltage on the um, actuator plate underneath. And the, these are springs here in the corners. This whole plate will come down, won't it? You guys see that? Opposites attract. This is an electrostatic switch. So I apply a voltage, this comes down, and now high frequency stuff can't go through this line because we're quenching it down the ground. That's an RF switch, very simple. Okay, but it does a really good job on quenching signals. Okay, and then the other thing, of course, you can make, so this is electromechanical, that's electromechanical. You can make mechanical parts. This is our world's smallest chain. Okay, um, this was designed by Paul Tafoya back in 2006, 2005 time frame. So this is old stuff, but these links here, okay, are about 10 microns apart. So from this point to this point is 10 microns. Okay? Yeah. So it's the world's smallest chain, which is pretty cool. Okay, done with layering. All right, so now we're going to talk about the, the um, bulk micromachining. Okay. So that's where we're going to remove a lot of material underneath. And this process is actually a little bit simpler. Okay, it's like taking a backhoe and making a, a trench. Okay, so it, it's basically a nice analogy for this is if you start with a, a mountain and you remove everything that doesn't look like a president, you get Mount Rushmore. Right? They made Mount Rushmore by removing rocks from the mountain until they got something that looked like a president, right? Well, the, uh, since we're in New Mexico, there's examples of that. In Mesa Verde's one, the Native Americans would etch out from a cliff um, rooms and things and, and etch out the caves underneath um, to make rooms, to, to make a, a structure. So they would bulk remove materials from the cliff and end up with some structure. And they also added to it, too. It's not strictly um, bulk etching here. Um, it, it, there's also some additive manufacturing as well going on. But we can do that on a micro scale as well. Which is what? In, is in Colorado? And there's, there's bandolier that has similar structures here in New Mexico. Okay, so what we're going to do this semester is we're going to make these chambers. And that we're going to use bulk etching for on the back of the wafer. So remember I said silicon nitride can act as a, as a, as a hard mask to protect material underneath? That's what we did here. We, we patterned the silicon nitride so we opened up a hole in the silicon nitride 
so that when we put this wafer in potassium hydroxide, we could etch out the chamber. Okay, so with bulk machining, you can do big structures such as chambers. Okay, and these are huge. You can also do things like um, microfluidic channels. So you can see there's a, there's a lot of opening here for few, um, liquids to go through. And then you have these microfluidic channels here to go to the different chambers. So these are deep as well. So bulk etching was done to create these larger reservoirs in this huge channel here. Okay? So we use bulk micromachining to, to make big structures like that. Um, most of the work done with bulk micromachining is done with um, etching. Okay? So here's another set of structures. This is what you're going to be making in the classroom or in the lab. You're going to be making these um, pressure sensors. Okay, so you can see from the front and from the back of the chip. Okay, and this, the membranes here were blown right here and here, and the membrane still remains on this structure here. So you can see that, you know, we've actually etched through the entire wafer. So you can etch through the wafer, but it stops on the silicon nitride because potassium hydroxide doesn't etch silicon nitride. So that's why we use it as a mask. Okay. Here's another structure. This is a proof mass. Okay, so this is a big mass that's sitting on a couple of springs, four springs here. Okay, so kind of kind of see, you know, get a mental picture of what's going on. This is a mesa structure because we etch crystalline silicon and so it follows the crystal planes and you'll learn about that as well. And this is a big mass sitting on a bunch of springs. Why would we do that? Exactly. So if you add acceleration, this proof mass is going to want to stay put. Right, so it's going to bend the springs. Right, if the frame moves, the chip is mounted on your car, and you slam on the brakes, right, then this thing is going to want to keep moving, and it's on a spring. So it will extend the spring, or compress it, depending what direction. So this will move relative to the frame. So imagine if I put something underneath here, like a metal plate. And this thing has a metal plate on it. You have a capacitor, right? Two metal plates is a capacitor. Okay? So I've got a capacitor. And it has capacitance C. Now if I slam on my brakes, this plate will get closer to the plate underneath. So now, I have a capacitor that's different, right? The plates are closer. So I just changed the electrical um, setup of my circuit, right? I changed the capacitance of the circuit. So you guys in electronics can design a circuit that measures a change in capacitance. Or you might get a voltage change, right? And, or some current might flow, okay? Because you're changing that distance between the two plates. But the point is, is I've got a mechanical motion and I'm turning it into an electrical signal. And then I can interpret that electrical signal as something happening. So in this case, if you slam on your brakes hard enough or hit a tree, right, then this capacitor is going to move, this plate's going to move even closer, and you get to the point where your electrical signal is high enough to actuate, say, an airbag. All right? So that's how all of these mechanical structures interact with electrical systems. And is that the pressure sensor we're building? Uh, this, this one on top is the pressure sensor we're building, this one here. This is a, this is a um, inertial sensor, an old one, old version, made at the uh, University of Michigan um, probably about 20 years ago. It's older technology, but it's still basically the same as what they use now in some of the sensors. Effect ratio parts as well. Okay, so silicon di dioxide and nitride films are used to mask the etching because photoresist tends to be thin 
and it wears down. If you're going to etch a lot of material, the photoresist may not stand up for the entire etch process. Okay? So we have, to, we have to play games. We have to put a hard mask on the material, okay, and then we have to etch it away. Um, Whatever is exposed from the hard All right, so what's really cool about um, using silicon, you can make grooves and membranes and channels and all sorts of things, okay? So if I use um, potassium hydroxide and I etch crystals and silicon, it's going to follow the 111 plane. And um, we had a unit on crystallography in the intro class. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it in this class and, and get you back up to speed. But this is the 111 plane, typically. And this is the 100 plane. So we usually buy 100-oriented crystalline silicon wafers. But if you etch an opening, it'll follow that plane until the two planes meet, and then it'll stop etching. So if I make this bigger, right, if I make this opening bigger, like this instead, then it's going to etch like that, isn't it? So I can get a bigger groove. So by designing the groove or the opening bigger or smaller, I can make the groove deeper or shallower. And if I go big enough, okay, I can go all the way through the wafer. So you can see how big it is here. I went all the way through the wafer until I met something that doesn't etch in that um, solution. So in this case, we made a silicon membrane by doping it. Okay? So if we use boron, and we stick it in the crystal structure, and then we try to etch it in potassium hydroxide, wherever the boron is, it slows the etching way, way, way down. So you can make a silicon membrane, or you can use something like um, silicon nitride and just etch to that on the other side like we're going to do. So you can make a lot of different structures. You can make channels, you can make holes. Now these didn't follow the crystal plane because we did something called reactive ion etching. So we don't have to make channels and grooves. We can also make straight sidewall structures such as this by using deep reactive ion etching or the Bosch process. So we can etch for a longer time, we can make it deeper, etch for a shorter time, make it shallower. And if we etch for a really long time, you can make a hole. Okay? So those are two examples of anisotropic etching. So you can do wet and dry etching, we'll learn more about it this semester. And then you can have anisotropic structures and isotropic structures. So what's anisotropic mean? So tropic is direction, like tropic of cancer on your globe. An means not, and iso means same. So that's direction, that's um, the same, and that's not. So not the same in all directions. So what would this be? Same. Same. Direction. In dir all directions. So you can see when we etch this, it etches down and etches to the left and right at the same rate. So you get something that looks like a hemisphere, right? Because it's all going in the same direction. The, the speed at which it's etching doesn't matter on the direction. This is anisotropic. It's etching down faster than it's etching out, right? So it's not the same in all directions. Okay. Usually this is associated with wet etching and this is associated with dry etching, except in the case of wet and isotropic etching, like when we etch crystals. All right. So um, we're going to use potassium hydroxide to etch the crystalline wafer in our bulk etching process. But you can use things like ethylene, diamine, uh, pyro, cat catechol. EDP is what they call it. EDP is nasty stuff, though. It's very cancerous. Okay, so if you're in a place that uses EDP to etch, 
Um, be very, very careful with that. Potassium hydroxide will just burn you like any type of a caustic will. It's a, it's a chemical burn, but it doesn't, um, doesn't mess with your chromosomes. EDP will. So EDP is nasty stuff, but the reason we use it is because it, it's very um, nice when it comes to playing with circuits. So if you're making a circuit next to a MEMS device and you need to do bulk etching, sometimes you'll use EDP. Tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide, TMAH, will also etch silicon, but TMAH is also used to develop a photoresist. So if you leave your wafer in photo, in photo developer for too long that has tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide in it, you'll start to etch the crystal and silicon as well. That happened to us at TI. I have a story about that. Uh, sodium hydroxide is another way to um, etch crystal and silicon. And we actually do that in, when we do it in a chemistry lab. Because sodium hydroxide you can buy at Home Depot and Lowe's. Okay. Sodium hydroxide is, is also known as drain cleaner. Okay. So you don't want to put drain cleaner on you either. And then hydrazine is another etchant that's, uh, that's used. That's rocket fuel. Okay? So that's nasty stuff. It's, it's pretty volatile. It's pretty reactive. Um, I've never used that, and I don't know if anybody has, but I think Harold's been in fabs where they've used hydrazine to etch. So just be aware that there's different chemistries you can use to, to do bulk etching. Um, you can do high kind of high resolution when you're using dry etching as opposed to wet etching, okay? So dry etching is using a plasma. You can get um, both iso and anisotropic profiles. You can get pretty small critical dimensions. Now less than three microns is pretty small for MEMS. Okay, it's huge when you're talking about transistors, but for MEMS it's pretty small. <coughs> Tool sets used for dry etching are more expensive than wet etching, and, they're, and they usually only work one wafer at a time. Okay? So it can be slower, and that's why you need more tools, but you get generally better results, more controlled results. So you have to play that game. How much control do I have to have? So if you go into like a, a clean room, you'll see dry etching tools and wet etching. So the less critical stuff goes into wet etching, critical stuff gets dry etched because it's more expensive. And we can do reactive ion etching, plasma etching, right? A isotropic plasma etching. Uh, sputter etching, which is also known as ion milling, and vapor phase etching. So there's a lot of different ways you can etch things um, in a dry environment, in a gas environment. Okay? It doesn't have to be liquid. It can be the cheapest. And then you can make all kinds of things like um, three-axis accelerometers like you see down below. Okay, so here's an X, Y, and Z accelerometer. So um, you can kind of tell that this, this set of bulk masses here okay, can move this way like this. All right, and then these in between, these structures in between, will measure the change in capacitance. And then you have the same thing here, okay? These bulk um, masses can move left and right. And then this one's different because this one goes out of plane, up and down. Okay? So we're measuring the, the vertical motion of that mass. So the X and Y structures are exactly the same. They're just rotated 90 degrees, but the Z structure has to be made differently. So two-axis accelerometers came out right away with MEMS. It took a while to integrate two-axis with three-axis. Now they have six-axis. Right? They have X, Y, Z. What do you think the other three are? X prime, Y prime, Z prime. <laughs> Theta, gamma, rotation. alpha, rotation. Right? So they use slightly other structures to do that. I'm not sure if they have nine. I can't think of what the, the other three would be. You know, you've got pitch, 
Um, right pitch is this way, forward and back in an airplane, right? And then you have tilt, left and right tilt in an airplane. And then you have yaw. You can, you can be pointing northwest and be flying <coughs> north, right, if you have a crosswind. So that's called yaw. So your plane's pointed in a different direction than the motion of the plane. So that's yaw. So that, those are three different angles, right? If you played with Cat a lot, like Shania, you know, you know about that, right? So she knows about six axis rotation, you know, three axes for rotation, and then you have placement of your structure in space, which is X, Y, and Z, the center of mass of the structure. So, you know, uh, we like to be able to, to do six axis uh, measurements, like in our, in our quadcopters. Right? They have six axis accelerometers in them so they know which way is up, left, right, down, and then all the different rotation angles it can be. You know, it can be pitched forward, it can be pitched to the left, pitched to the right, and then also rotate about an axis. That's a yaw. So you're hard to handle. Oh, they're really hard. Yeah, you can buy a little one now for 30 bucks, a little micro. Uh, quadcopter. So you, you push going forward, that thing will straight go down. You got to be real careful. Yeah, but the newer ones have better um, logic in them to help you fly it stable. Well, it, it's self stabilized, it's self calibrating, so it'll hover better. Yeah, I just got one for my nephew. Uh, he wants to be a pilot, so he's been flying things on the computer for decades, you know. And uh, so I got him a, a quadcopter that has a camera in it. So that should be pretty cool. Yeah, but that's got MEMS devices in it, so I'm biased, right? I like to buy things that have MEMS in them. Okay, and then here's, a, here's another bulk micro machine type of um, um, device. You can make a cantilever. And then you can coat the cantilever with um, different materials. So different antibodies or, or molecules or types of cells will stick to it depending on what you coat on there. Okay, and um, if you did the cantilever experiment, how many of you did the cantilever experiment in intro? So half of you didn't. Yeah, so we'll probably do some of that as the dry lab, but, you know, when half the group's in the, in the clean room, the other half isn't. I'll have you do the cantilever. It's, it's kind of fun. It, it shows how, how these sensors work. Okay, the last thing is LIGA, which is long involved German acronym. Lithography, Galvo, Opformung, or Galvo, Formung, and Opformung. Basically, you do lithography. So you build a structure in, in something like photoresist. It's actually a different material. And you can make 3D structures. Um, uh, using this process, and then you electroplate back into it. So we may try that experiment this semester. We have a simulation for lithography we can do in the classroom. So you'll get to get to learn a little bit about electroplating and this type of process. It's kind of fun. You, you plate copper onto a substrate. Um, but, you know, we use uh, a different type of course. Um, we use x-rays instead of uh, um, blue and green light to image the material that's light photoresist. It's called PMMA. Okay, it was created in the 80s in Karlsruhe Nuclear Research Center. I actually got to visit that place. It's called Anka now. And they make a lot of cool molds and high aspect ratio structures for micro um, micro machining applications. Okay, so you can see here it's a little gear that was made using LIGA. You can actually use other micro machining processes to make that, but that was a proof of concept. So you can see it's got very, t it's a very tall structure. Um, it's not that small, they can go much, much smaller than that. Okay, basically the way you make it is you have a mask. Okay, and your mask is, in this case, instead of chrome on glass, like with regular light, you use 
um, gold on beryllium instead. Gold is really good at stopping x-rays. That's why you have to use gold. If you use chrome, it won't stop the x-rays as well. And then we use beryllium because beryllium is very clear for x-rays. Glass is not as clear for x-rays. It scatters them. Okay? So here you can see a gold structure sitting on a beryllium plate. Then we shine x-rays through here. And we're going to expose this really thick uh, material called PMMA. Polymethyl methacrylate. It's like it's plexiglass. So if you expose that to, to x-rays, then you can develop out the parts that got hit by x-rays. And you end up with a, a really cool mass. Okay, so if we look at that, hopefully I didn't screw up the recording. Um, if you do the LIGA process, um, you, you can actually uh, expose and develop this very thick plexiglass that's shown here. Okay, we've exposed this area and then we developed it out. And then we electroform. So instead of putting material on top and filling in the hole, we actually put the material inside of an electroplating system because this is metal underneath here on the bottom. This is all metal. So if we put a voltage here and we put this in a bath with um, ions in it, okay, so if we have positive ions floating in the bath, and we put a negative voltage here, these ions will want to collect and stick and start to build up inside this structure. So you can build up an electroplated metal structure inside that form. That's called electroforming. Okay? So that's part of your homework. So you, you put the structure that you've patterned that has a metal base plate on it in electrolyte solution. Okay, and then you have a cathode and an anode. The anode is, is made out of the material you want to deposit, so that's the source of the ions. And the cathode is um, what you connect the mold to. And so those ions are attracted to the, to the metal plate that ex, that's exposed with the mold on it. And, and you can build up those structures, so you can make very high aspect ratio structures with the PMMA. And you end up, you know, once you get rid of the PMMA, right, that's what we did here. We planarized it first to make the top of the gear flat. And then we remove the PMMA and we have the gear sitting on the metal plate. And you can pull that off and have an individual part. Or you can leave it on and you have a stamp, right? So if you want to make channels, really small channels in plastic, you can make a metal mold of it, right? So you have, um, you can make a mold that looks like this. Okay, so this is all the metal. And then if you push it into plastic, the plastic is going to take on the, the form of a channel, right? So now I can make really small channels because I can make really small, tall metal structures. I can make really small channels in plastic. And then I can re re reuse the stamp over and over and over again. Because this is a relatively... Um, but you can get some really cool stuff with it. You can make uh, high aspect ratio springs. These are very small springs. You might use them in a small digital camera. Or in a focusing element in your phone. You need these, these kind of parts, right? You need tall, skinny springs. Okay? Or you might make really tall, thin structures that have very small space in between them. This could be a filter, right? You could put a top on this thing. So now you only have very small holes here for things to pass through, and you've made a filter. If you wanted to take out something out of the solution that's um, got a charge on it, you can put a voltage on these things, right? If you make them out of metal. So anything that has a charge on it is going to stick to this. So it's a nice electrolytic type filter. Okay? So that's another application. And then you guys know what this is, you photonics guys? Do you know what this thing is right here? Fiber optic cable? It's fiber optic. 
I don't know how much you've uh, had to align fiber optic cables, right? It's really hard to do, but you can use Liga to make these, these connectors, these snap-in connectors. So you just snap your fiber optic cable in and they're perfectly aligned. So that's another application. Okay? And then here, this, these are copper plated, you know, copper mesh. Again, it could be a type of filter maybe. And here they did a double exposure, didn't they? So they exposed this structure, and then they rotated the mask and the angle of the x-rays coming in, and then they did this structure. And then they, um, they electroplated into the holes they made, into the PMMA, these copper tubes, right? Polished the top off, remove the PMMA in between, and they end up with a copper mesh. And what's cool about this is the mesh is perfectly um, structured. They know exactly what this width is, right? So they can make a finer mesh or a broader mesh depending on the application. And I'm not really sure what this application is. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably uh, uh, some kind of a, a refined. Um, this one over here I really like. This is a heat exchanger. And they can, um, I saw a similar one about the same size. It was actually looks like a cube. Um, but it could, it could heat, do heat transfer at one kilowatt. That's a lot. A kilowatt's like a space heater that you'd have in your room. They can heat transfer one kilowatt um, using something this small. So it's, a, it's an extremely cool cooling device, right? So they're looking at using this type of um, technology to make heat exchangers to keep your PCs and electronic equipment cool. Okay, you can make gas chromatography um, channels. So usually what you want to do with gas chromatography is to pass gas through a, through a channel and at, after three meters, the heavier molecules are further behind than the lighter ones. So you put a puff of gas in on the front end, and then you time when you start detecting molecules coming out of the back end. And the lighter ones come out first, and the heavier ones later, and then you can tell what's in the gas, right? So it's, it's a way of detecting what's in gas. It's a really well-established system. So they made a gas chromatography system, and you can see the input and the output, right? This is out. This would be in. And it, they have a three-meter spiral in there. So they have three meters of channel inside this little block, which is smaller than a penny. Three meters? Three meters. So it used to be, you know, a desktop machine. Probably took up two desks, like this whole desk here, to do gas chromatography. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Now they have the main element here. And then they add a couple other devices, a, a surface acoustic wave sensing device and, and that sort of thing. So, you, you know, there's a big push to making things smaller. Here's another heat exchanger, right? This, this looks simple, but I bet you inside the channels probably run, run like this. You know, and then come back out. So it's a serpentine pattern. So this this is a really effective heat exchanger as well. And you can use um, Liga to make the channels. Okay. So this is probably one of the most classic pictures. This is an actual Liga part made at Anka in Karlsruhe, and they placed it on the. Um, foot of an ant to show you the size. Okay, so this is a real picture. They went back and colorized this in Photoshop, but it's a real picture. It's probably one of the most used uh, MEMS pictures that you'll see, you know, um, in magazines and stuff. They use this all the time. Yeah, yeah you'll see it in magazines, but it's funny because, you know, we asked them for permission to use their picture, to use this picture. And they, they sent us a nice letter back saying, 
I don't know why you're at, you ask. No one else ever has. <laughs> but it's copyright laws, right? You're not supposed to steal pictures without permission. But they gave us permission, and they were happy we asked them. Is that picture taken by electron microscope? Yeah, that's an electron microscope picture. So, you know, it's pretty cool. I mean, ants are, are small, but you can see how small the gear is. So. And that's about it for the lecture today. So.